Radio enthusiasts know just how annoying it can be when you switch on your set and are met with high levels of background noise. It can really hamper your listening efforts and make the bands unusable. Now imagine being a scientist at a colossal 250 foot diameter radio telescope at the height of the space age and seeing your work ruined by radio interference. This is the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank Observatory in Cheshire. It's so powerful it could detect a mobile phone signal on Mars over 226 million miles away. It's no coincidence that therefore mobile phones aren't allowed on the site and there's clear signage at the entrance saying so. I emailed Jodrell Bank a year or so ago to ask them about their elusive and not widely reported radio quiet zone, but it seems they didn't want to reply to YouTube's leading expert in all things radio, and quite honestly, the font of all radio knowledge. And they didn't reply to me either. So, I thought I'd do some digging and find out for myself the history behind why interference is so bad for Jodrell Bank and how it's combated. Jodrell Bank needs regulatory protection at the highest level, i.e. from the ITU which reserves frequency bands for radio astronomy use that won't be used by conflicting users. It needs strong local protection, i.e. a council that strictly controls planning applications. This helps mitigate interference from electrical devices not recognised as radio transmitters such as heavy machinery and consumer electronics. And finally, it needs self-protection, i.e. interference mitigation techniques. In the 1950s and 60s, interference from a car starting up two miles away could ruin a signal being tracked from a galaxy millions of light years away. Even a telex machine on the premises, which the GPO never managed to suppress, had to be switched off before certain experiments could take place. The signals designed to be received were so weak that the slightest interference could spoil them. Jodrell Bank couldn't differentiate between signals from stars or other local interference sources. The location of Jodrell Bank was chosen because it's reasonably close to Manchester University, because of the record of low wind velocity on the Cheshire Plain, and because Jodrell Bank enjoyed the greatest possible freedom from electrical interference in that area. Protection of a considerable zone around Jodrell Bank has in fact been in place since 1973. This was formalised by Parliament in the Jodrell Bank Consultation Zone Directive of 1973 and was recently readdressed by the UK Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government in a judgment of November 2016, which stated that Jodrell Bank Observatory, as an established world-class facility, should be afforded reasonable protection. The Town and Country Planning Jodrell Bank Radio Telescope Direction 1973, issued under the powers of the Town and Country General Development Order 1973, imposes considerable restriction on new development within an area of just over 18,500 hectares within an approximate 6 mile radius of Jodrell Bank. This allows the observatory to challenge developments which might produce excessive radio frequency interference. The battle for radio quiet was headed up by Sir Alfred Charles Bernard Lovell, a British physicist and radio astronomer. He was the first director of Jodrell Bank Observatory from 1945 until 1981. He personally attended virtually every planning meeting in the surrounding area to battle for Jodrell Bank's right to radio quiet and was the thorn in the side of planners and local councils. He was like a dog with a bone and felt strongly about the quiet zone which became a bone of contention. Now, I don't wish to portray him in any other way than a genius and a pioneer. In 1955, there was a widespread development ban proposed by the Department of Industry and Scientific Research in order to protect Jodrell Bank Radio Telescope from electrical interference. The proposed 10-mile radius exclusion zone was met with strong opposition from 16 councils in Cheshire and their residents. It would be impossible to draw a dividing line between what was and wasn't classed as electrical interference. As discussions continued, an 8 mile radius was proposed, and by the end of the year, a radius of 6 miles was discussed. At this time, the Lovell Telescope wasn't even finished. Construction began on the 3rd of September 1952, and it was finally completed in 1957. It's unclear if any radio quiet zone was actually established in the area when the telescope was finished. Nevertheless, Bernard Lovell threw himself into any planning meeting he could to protect the zone around the telescope. August 1961 saw a planning application for houses in Allistock and Bernard Lovell told a local inquiry that electrical appliances in the homes would seriously reduce the effectiveness of the telescope. The planning proposal was initially rejected, but it appears that bungalows were eventually built sometime during the 1960s off New Platte Lane, 2.2 miles away from the telescope. 
Lovell attended another local inquiry in September 1962, in opposition to 25 houses that were planned for a plot of land near the Red Lion Inn in Goosetree. Again, he was concerned that the electrical interference from appliances within the houses could be disastrous to the observatory's work. This site was just 1.1 miles away. Interference had grown worse in the last five years, and Lovell feared that the young telescope could end up out of action. He voiced his concerns at the meeting called by the land developers, and after much debate, the rejection was upheld in December 1962, much to the relief of Lovell. Jodrell Bank was hit with an unusual kind of interference in February 1964. Bernard, who was opposing an appeal at Sandbach against Cheshire County Council's refusal to allow residential developments near Jodrell Bank, now had another interference case on his hands. The signal, believed to be caused by the engine of a courting couple's moped, was affecting observations of a star 10 light years away. On the night the interference started, it cut into the beam of the telescope and completely obliterated the signal for 10 minutes. Lovell claimed it was probably a young man who took his girlfriend home because it happened every night at the same time. I can think of no other case in which he would allow his engine to die out than to rev up again, he said. One night, the moped interference had been later than its customary time of 11pm. On that night, the star was being photographed by American cameras scattered around the globe and was being observed by a big Russian telescope. If it had begun 30 minutes earlier, at its usual time, it would have completely destroyed the record of observations. The moped's unsuppressed bleep bleep signal was believed to be 2-3 to three miles away in Holmes Chapel. The team at the observatory managed to trace it with relative accuracy, with a view to suppressing the interference. The moped was ultimately never traced. A similar incident happened years earlier, in which tracking of the Russian Mars probe was obliterated by a nearby car engine. I found some information suggesting that an agreement was made between Cheshire County Council in 1967, which alludes to a six-mile radius planning consultation zone around Jodrell Bank, but I'm not sure how official this was. Not every planning meeting was sympathetic to Bernard and Jodrell Bank. At one meeting in August 1968, despite the minister upholding the planning rejection against houses at Cranage, three miles to the southwest, the minister rejected Bernard Lovell's interference concerns. Jodrell Bank admitted that interference from one individual house could not be detected, and that a greater amount of interference already existed at Goosetree than at Cranage. The minister felt that their objection was general in nature and didn't award it any merit. Bernard Lovell told yet another inquiry in Sandbach in September 1968 that any relaxation to the building control rules would be disastrous and against national interest. This was at another appeal meeting on the back of a planning rejection for 23 homes on Heath Lane in Brereton, four miles south of Jodrell Bank. It was becoming clear that the council areas were becoming less sympathetic to Lovell and the observatory. By summer 1969, those wanting to see the expansion of Holmes Chapel made it clear to Jodrell Bank that they intended to continue with their efforts. They referred to the observatory as Big Brother, and even had fears that those in the council were ruled by the observatory, and had a hand in all planning applications for the area. It was decided to negotiate with Jodrell Bank the 1967 agreement I mentioned earlier, with a view to revoking it. How far this went isn't clear, and it would be a few years before the final 1973 agreement was set up. A development on Northwich Road in Cranage, 3.3 miles away, was warned against in October 1969 by Reginald Lascelles, special assistant to Bernard Lovell. By now, Lovell felt so strongly about Jodrell Bank's interference issue that he was regularly accused of wanting to stop people from living in Cheshire altogether. This accusation reared its head again in April 1970 at a meeting opposing the construction of a dining room at the Swettenham Arms pub in Congleton. Lovell feared it would attract increased motor traffic to the area, causing further interference. Operators at the observatory were already becoming more and more concerned by increased interference as it was. The issue was worsening every week according to Lovell. An application for two bungalows at Brereton Heath, four miles away, was refused in May 1971 as a direct result of Jodrell Bank's opposition. Bernard attended the hearing and described how the proposed site lay in the direction most often probed by the telescope. By 1973, the town and country Jodrell Bank radio telescope direction I mentioned at the start of this video was set up and required the council to consult with the University of Manchester before granting planning permission on any application for development subject to certain exceptions. 
Cheshire County Council reviewed the Jodrell Bank Agreement in January 1978, asking if it needed protection from interference any longer. They felt that planning and development should come before the observatory's operations. Fortunately, Jodrell Bank continued to be protected and has been ever since. One story lost to time shows just how sensitive the equipment here really is. Dancers of the Bolshoi Ballet pirouetted across the TV screen at Jodrell Bank in December 1984. Telescope operators were watching Moscow 1 TV, picked up from a Russian satellite. Suddenly the screen went fuzzy, and white blips began flashing. It was 4.10pm. Something was interfering with the satellite signals that were being picked up by a 6 metre diameter dish near the observatory's main radio telescope. Reginald Lascelles called in the engineers, but they couldn't find anything wrong. They thought perhaps freak weather was to blame, but this was soon discounted. The interference was back on the screen the next day at 4.10pm again. Engineers checked but found nothing. The next day, the interference returned again at 4.10pm. As dusk fell, engineers gathered around the TV screen. The white blips appeared on schedule. All agreed that the interference was coming from outside. They took a 6 foot square aluminium sheet outside and held it up to screen the dish and block the interference. They were startled by a bird fluttering skywards from the centre of the dish. The culprit had been found. It was a great tit. There was a small hole at the base of the dish's central antenna, and the bird was entering at the same time every evening and using it to roost. It was partly blocking the satellite signal. Netting was stretched across the hole to prevent the issue returning. By the 1990s, a new type of interference began to plague Jodrell Bank, the mobile telephone. The observatory banned them in January 1994, citing interference issues. Radio quiet zone signs were erected around the site, and from then on, visitors and workers were asked to turn off their phones. When Cranage Hospital closed in 1995, proposals were put forward to convert it to homes. Jodrell Bank rallied residents of four local villages to object to the plans. It's now the Devere Hotel and Conference Centre, and is three miles away. Bernard Lovell remained as observatory director right up until his retirement in 1981, but the battle was never really over. As my research into this topic continued to the present day, I came across countless objections by Jodrell Bank to planning applications in the vicinity of the observatory. The problem is now much worse than ever. Yes, electronics are much cleaner than they were in the 1950s and 60s, but there are mobile phone transmitters in close proximity to Jodrell Bank. A railway GSMR mast is right next to the telescope. There's high voltage overhead wires above the adjacent railway. Cars go past all the time, with mobile phones, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi all inside. Aircraft pass close by as they approach and depart Manchester Airport, and there are now more homes than ever in the vicinity of the observatory. Of course, we can surmise that the filtering within the equipment is better now than it ever was, but I wonder how well the Lovell telescope really is shielded from background radio noise. In later life, Bernard Lovell became frail, as you'd expect for a 98-year-old. He lived in quiet retirement in the countryside in Swettenham, the very area in which he battled against property construction decades earlier. He died at home on the 6th of August 2012. Thank you.